I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, my co-author, uh, Metis Sudamenov, and um, he's actually retired now, um, but for a lot of years uh, he was instrumental in uh, promoting uh, soil conservation practices, uh, increasing adoption of uh, no-till and crop diversification in Kazakhstan. And he's, he's associated with the they love long names over there, so it's AI Barrio Scientific and Production Center of Grain Farming in Short Andy, which is just north of the capital, Astana. So just some background first uh, on the Republic of Kazakhstan. It's the ninth largest country in the world. Um, so a lot of people don't realize just how big it is actually. So uh, it's ranked number nine. Um, after Argentina there, um, 2,000 or 2,727,000 square kilometers in area and approximately that is the size of Western Canada, uh, BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba combined. It's uh, got the honor of being the world's largest landlocked country. Um, so being landlocked I guess uh, for exports uh, that is an issue and uh, Generally, the exports come through um, from the uh, western side of the country. The Caspian Sea there is borders the western side. Uh, a lot of exports are shipped across the Caspian Sea, and then they go by rail across southern Russia to the Black Sea, and then out uh, through the Bosphorus to the Mediterranean. So, so getting their exports to market is, is uh, a bit of an issue for them. Population, 6.6 .6 million. Um, so about half the population of Canada. Uh, in terms of where it's at uh, geographically, uh, China on the east, Russia to the north, and then some of the other Stan countries, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan, um, and the Caspian Sea. Um, it was part of the former Soviet Union until it gained independence in 1991. And during the Cold War, it was just a Soviet Republic that a lot of people didn't really know was there. And then after the breakup of the Soviet Union, all those countries became independent and we started to hear more about them. Um, this was a book that I actually read before I went there and, and Rob, if you are headed there, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. Kazakhstan, because of its situation in Central Asia, um, back in the old days was sort of, some branches of the Silk Road actually that were headed from Europe to the Far East, went through Kazakhstan. So it was a very important uh, trading route back then. But I guess during the Cold War, it kind of was called the Lost Heart of Asia. And this book is actually a very interesting read. It's a, a British uh, travel writer. And he's written actually a number of books on, on Central Asia. And they're all very readable and very entertaining. In terms of the arable land, 25 million hectares um, in the country of Kazakhstan. And if we compared that with the Canadian prairies, uh, we're about 29 million hectares of cropland in the three prairie provinces. So when you look at a map, actually, and uh, you draw the lines of latitude um, across Kazakhstan all the way to the southern prairies, you see that we're essentially at the same latitude um, 49 to 55 degrees north, um, so it puts us very similar latitude. Um, and then Akbola province is in the north of Kazakhstan, and um, the capital city, it's actually a new capital, Astana, it's only been the capital since 1997. Uh, the previous capital was a city called uh, Almaty, down in the extreme south in the more mountainous uh, southern region. Um, Astana then is in the northern steppe region. Um, and you can see there, if you draw a line, it's at 51 degrees 42 minutes north, Astana is, which is sort of right around uh, Olds or sort of Didsbury, if you draw that sort of similar latitude length um, across uh, Alberta. So just comparing, I guess, uh, soil development, um, very similar. Soils were formed under prairie, steppe grassland. They're naturally fertile, um, high organic matter, um, Chernozems, Kistanozems, 
Um, so very similar um, soil forming uh, in, in both regions. In terms of the history, uh, Alberta, as you know um, from Ross's talk yesterday, um, a lot of the prairie in Alberta um, was broken up late 1800s, uh, mostly early 1900s. And it's been estimated that we've lost about 20-30% of our initial soil organic sea um, since that initial breakup. Angola province in Kazakhstan, it wasn't until the 1950s actually that most of the land was first cultivated. And generally under, under uh, the Soviet Union, um, what happened was they decided to open up that part of, of the Soviet Union to agriculture. So the story goes that the, there were tractors and ploughs put on trains back in Russia, in Moscow, and they were sent by train out to Kazakhstan. <coughs> the tractors and ploughs, ploughs were offloaded and they went to work and uh, they, in three years basically ploughed up uh, almost the entire steppe region. So as you can imagine, um, there was uh, some severe erosion problems then. But the estimate is, is 10 to 20 percent loss of initial soil carbon. So it's actually not as high as what we have here on the prairies, um, maybe because it hasn't been as long since that land was broken. In terms of some of the climate comparisons, um, if we look here, this is mean monthly earth temp air temperature, Astana versus Lethbridge. And you can see that uh, our growing season temperatures are actually very similar um, in terms of uh, 14 degrees for Astana, 13.8 for Lethbridge. So that's really close, or April to September, uh, mean monthly uh, temperature. Winters, on the other hand, are a lot colder um, in Astana. So minus 10.4 October to March, and we are at minus one degree here. So, so the main difference is in, in their colder winters. Um, and so a mean annual temperature, uh, 1.8 in Astana and 6.4 in Lethbridge. This is precipitation, and you can see uh, some uh, subtle differences here, and it's mostly in the growing season precipitation. Astana is at 200 millimeters, and we are at uh, 294. So basically, one and a half times higher during the growing season. So they really do suffer from uh, much more arid conditions than, than we're used to here. And you can see actually that July is their wettest month. It's slightly offset uh, June being ours. And actually the May, June, that sort of early growing season precipitation, uh, we get about twice as much as they do uh, if you combine May and June there. So they're only at about 60 millimeters for May and June, and we're up uh, over 120. Um, so basically, on an annual basis, um, well, actually, the winter precips are amazingly similar. Um, in fact, we're slightly less in Lethbridge than Astana. And then annually, we get about 25% more. Farm management and land use. Um, basically, the government owns all the land and has leased uh, long-term leases, 49 to 99 year terms on their leases. There's three main types of farms, uh, the largest being what they call agricultural enterprises or co-ops. And these may have up, up to 200 members in the co-op. Uh, on average, they're about 3,000 hectares. And some of them are up to um, half a million hectares. So quite large. Um, and they tend to be organized under these agro-holding companies. So they operate the farms in terms of providing capital and marketing uh, produce from the farms. Then um, they go down to what they call their peasant farms. Now they use that word, I didn't put that word in there. So they are smaller, uh, run by two to three families, uh, 250 hectares, um, well, 7 to 250, and then up to 1,000 hectares. And then they have just small household plots, uh, one family and sort of less than uh, one hectare. The largest single farm actually is 1 million hectares, and I think it did boast of being the largest farm in the world. Um, and if you put it out on a square, it's basically 100 by 100 kilometers, so you can imagine it's uh, quite a large farm. Comparatively, Alberta, the average farm size is about 450 hectares, uh, about 1,100 acres. 
In terms of crop yields, uh, these pictures here are from Akmola province, so um, visually there's not a lot of difference. You could be anywhere on the prairies really, um, except you don't see as much of, of canola as you would on the prairies. Um, in terms of their wheat yields, on average 1.3 tonnes per hectare. In dry years, that's down to 0.6. Uh, in a good year, 2.3. Um, generally, the lower yields are they don't apply a lot of fertilizer, and I think things that we take for granted, like adding fertilizer, using herbicides, they're not basically generally used um, like like we would here. So, uh, for example, in a five-year rotation, they might have four years of grains, so wheat and barley, and then one year of peas, and they might only add fertilizer um, prior to the peas. Canola yields are typically 0.5. 0.7 tons per hectare and if we compare the black soil zone of Alberta you know our average spring wheat yields are much higher than that two and a half to three our canola yields 1.3 so so roughly about double um, the yields that they're getting in Kazakhstan. Crop diversification um, this is Alberta from 2011 um, so basically we've got a very good split 44% uh, cereals about a quarter roughly each in oil season forages, 3% pulses, 5% fallow. This is Agmola uh, 2012. Um, you can see still a huge reliance on cereals, 84%. Uh, so a lot of land area under cereals, a lot of uh, monoculture. Only 4% oil seeds, 7% uh, forages, 0.4% uh, pulses, and actually the same amount of fallow as we have. So. Yeah. Um, Just a quick question, is that spring cereals because of the cold wind? Yeah, okay. yeah, Thanks. yeah, spring wheat. Yeah. Um, so the stat actually, when I was doing like the compare and contrast, uh, the one that's exactly the same actually is their summer fallow. Um, and both Alberta and Akmola province were 16% in 1981. They've both fallen to only 5% in 2011, 2012. Tillage methods, um, this is Akmola in 2011 and you can see that they are at about 15% um, conventional tillage, 75% minimum and 10% no-till. So now when they talk no-till too, um, you say, oh, is this field a no-till? And they say, oh yeah, it was, but you know, we worked it up last year. Whereas when we talk no-till, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's continuous no-till, like that land hasn't been cultivated for you know, X number of years. So you kind of have to you say, oh yeah, it's a no-till, but then when you ask questions further and tease it out, well, it's, they might do some spring tillage or maybe there was a fall tillage done a couple of years ago. So it's kind of not what we would call continuous no-till. Um, Alberta, um, we're at 13%, so similar conventional, 22% um, minimum, and we're at 65% uh, no-till, so uh, much higher adoption here. Um, and actually, when I went back to the historical stats for Alberta, so I went back to 1996 when Alberta was at 10% no-till, Agmola is at 10% no-till in 2011, but back in 1996, um, we had 57% still under conventional tillage in 1996, whereas Agmola is only at 15%. And they have a much higher level of minimum tillage currently than we had back in 1996. So, so they're moving in the right direction. It's just taking a bit of time, I guess. Five minutes. Okay. In terms of land use, um, we saw a lot of this type of scenario, so basically abandoned land or margin land that was let ret return to sort of um, native rangeland. And as I mentioned, 25 million hectares was ploughed up under uh, Khrushchev uh, in the 1950s, and then about a quarter of that was followed each year. With the breakup of the Soviet Union, there was this transition from centrally planned production to the free market economy. Uh, loss of subsidies for state and collective farms, and about 10 million hectares of marginal land. So this was not very high yielding land, it was abandoned or, or essentially returned to permanent pasture. So you do see driving around quite a lot of land uh, that's not being farmed right now. Something else that uh, we have in common uh, at Mola and Alberta 
is oil production. And actually, this is the Northern Caspian Sea. And uh, these oil fields, uh, this Kashigan, which is actually offshore, it's out in the sea, and Tengiz, are considered two of the newest, uh, largest uh, soil or oil reserves in the world right now. Um, so they're really ramping up their oil production and uh, they're looking to sort of take their place on the world stage with oil production and also agriculture. Um, their cattle numbers, um, basically this comparison looks at 1991 and 2011. They had uh, over 9 million uh, cattle back in 1981 in, in the country of mm -hmm. Kazakhstan, but their numbers have dwindled to just about 6 million right now. Um, so they're really looking at increasing their livestock production as well and getting more of a mix into their farming operations than just straight uh, crop production. Whereas on the other hand, our numbers have actually come up uh, in Western Canada. This is combined here, uh, the four Western provinces. Um, so we've actually maintained or actually increased our cattle numbers. So in terms of overall strategies to increase agricultural production in Northern Kazakhstan, they're looking at boosting yields on their existing cropland. So in terms of uh, you know, fertilizer, um, herbicide use, which aren't big right now. Um, they're looking at providing subsidies for high, high quality seed, fertilizer, herbicides, pesticides. Increased adoption of no-till. They're already moving uh, on that spectrum. There's quite a lot of uh, land in reduced or minimum tillage. They're looking at more oil seeds in rotations, uh, canola, um, in the less arid areas of the north and then sunflower in drier areas. Increased pulses in rotations to get that added end benefit. Um, recover potentially productive but currently idle land. They're looking at that. So I'm just going to finish off with some sort of general um, slides. Uh, this is a tour group. Uh, you might recognize some of the faces in there. Gila Fond is there on the, on the right hand side at the back from Indian Head to, with Ag Canada. Uh, Yang Tai Gan is in there too on the ground pulling up the pea plants to look uh, at the roots. Uh, Yang Tai Gan from Swift Current. So um, you do see a lot of European um, equipment. Uh, this is Amazon, they're a German uh, machinery manufacturer. Uh, that's Gila Fond there. Um, Wild oats, uh, we did see, and then the question was, well, is this, you know, is there herbicide resistance? Well, there would be if we actually use herbicides, but <laughs> so it's, uh, you do, this is actually a field of wheat, but uh, a huge wild oat infestation. Um, this is uh, some disc uh, drills, some zero-till disc drills, imported actually from Argentina, uh, on one of these large farms that we visited. <coughs> So right beside this newer equipment, there was this lines of the old sort of old-fashioned uh, seed drills, and there this was kind of a, a machinery graveyard. And there was uh, anyone that's in the scrap metal business, I think they should head to Kazakhstan because we saw a lot of this uh, old equipment uh, that was used back in Soviet times and not used anymore. Summer fallow is dropped down to about five percent uh, of the land area, so. You don't see much of this actually, so that's very good obviously for soil conservation. Um, horses are an important part of the culture over there, and uh, mare's milk is actually uh, widely consumed, and I did have the chance to try it. They ferment it, it's, it's kind of like drinking a thick yogurt or a buttermilk, and uh, it's supposed to uh, improve uh, your overall. Uh, I think libido is the word to use. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't test that out, but anyway, it's very, it's uh, it's actually quite an acquired taste. Um, the mare's milk. So um, we did see some camels, uh, some sheep, um, horse meat, and with the scandal going on in Europe now, I, I decided to put this one in. Uh, they're finding horse meat in their burgers over there. It's a huge scandal. But horse meat is it is the delicacy. It's their national dish, and uh, we did eat quite a bit uh, when we were traveling through, and it's very tasty. Astana, the capital, is a very modern capital because it's so new, and what they did, the government, is they hired some top-notch European architects, and they built this sort of very futuristic, um, almost surreal landscape, um, some really sort of gleaming, sort of glittering architecture. This is sort of the main mall in downtown Astana, and... Um, 
some really nice new buildings and park land. This is their presidential palace and uh, modeled on, on the White House in Washington. So, um, and this is our group uh, in front of uh, the building in, at the Green Farming Institute in Short Andy. And they had all the flags out for us uh, on arrival there. So, um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you very much.